Good morning, beloved community. Glad to see you all today. We are going to wait for the high sign that we are streaming, and then we'll get started with our worship service. Oh, we're already streaming. How about that? Welcome to worship, everybody. Where you go, I'll go. Where you stay, I'll stay. When you move, I'll move. I will follow. All your ways are good. All your ways are sure. I will trust in you. I above my life I will trust in you alone in you alone where you go I'll go when you stay I'll stay when you move I'll move I will follow you when you love I'll love now you serve I'll serve if this life I lose I will follow everyone and welcome to worship this morning welcome to Knox Presbyterian Church we are so glad you're here if you are new or a fairly recent visitor we welcome you we hope that you feel at home here and as always for all of us this is God's house where everyone has a place so may we all feel at home and if you are new and are in our present in person I'd love to say hello to you please find me after the service We'd love to welcome you more personally. And you can also find us at knox.org. You can find contact information. We'd love to share how you can get connected with us. A few announcements today. Today is Communion Sunday. And a word for those of you worshiping virtually with us, you'll want to gather for yourself what will serve as your bread and your cup, a juice, whatever is the fruit of the vine for you. 
All elements are worthy at this sacred meal. And I'll say more about how we'll celebrate communion at that time. Today at 2 p.m., you have an opportunity to experience a Knox music series. Those of you who are used to attending those twice each year in person, this is an opportunity to do so virtually. At 2 p.m., this three-part series will be available and it will also be available to view on August 8th and August 15th as well. You can find that at Knox.org, Facebook, and our new YouTube channel. And this music series was recorded last spring by the Knox Choir soloists and section leaders, guest instrument, instrumentalists, and on the organ and piano is our Chris, Dr. Christina Hahn. So enjoy that sacred music. We give a big thanks to all of you who contributed to the third Presbyterian Church back to school drive. So many supplies have come in. Backpacks will be filled for our young friends in need as they get ready for school. If you still have donations, we're receiving those until the end of the day tomorrow. There are bins at various entrances of the church to drop those off. And finally, we get to welcome our guest preacher today, Lisa Allgood. Lisa is the executive presbyter of the Presbytery of Cincinnati. And one of her many roles is that she serves as pastor to the pastors. She is a great encouragement to all the congregations, helping leading them as they seek to listen to God's will and call. And Lisa is a ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church. She has other vocational aspects to her life. Before this call, she served at P&G. She has a background in science, and she has been so helpful to our entire presbytery during this pandemic, keeping us updated on the, the most recent COVID realities, encouraging us and guiding us as um, sessions, as congregations, and how to move forward and navigate this difficult time. Great source of prayer and comfort she offers to all of us. So we welcome the word she will bring today. Welcome, Lisa. So I invite us now to catch up with our bodies, however we may need that, to invite you to take a deep breath in, a full inhale, and let it all out. Close your eyes if you wish and bring your attention to this present moment where God is. This is God, your creator, who created you with great joy, who delights in your existence, in your presence here, in your attention. Allow God's loving gaze as you keep breathing And now let's follow God's loving gaze that is cast across the world as we remember together in silent prayer all who are working for God's peace and love and justice, we pray. Amen. God has called us here. All gratitude and devotion are due to our God of restoration, renewal, and ongoing resurrection. Yesterday is past. Today, this moment is brand new. And tomorrow is safely in the hands of our creator. God knows, understands, sustains, and sends us. Let us open our hearts to God's call. Let us worship God. Friends, for our first song, we're going to do This Is The Day. And if it's a familiar song to you, please sing along with us. If it is a new song, the band is going to model the chorus one time, and then we'll go through and sing it again. So you're invited to sing with us, and you're invited to stand in body or in spirit. This is the day. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice, let us 
us rejoice and be glad. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad. struck with power. The right hand of God is exalted. I shall not die, but I shall live and proclaim the works of the Lord. This is the day. This is the day. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice and be glad. The stone which the builders rejected has become the foundation of our house. By the Lord has this been done. How wonderful to be called. This is the day. This is the day. You may be seated. We give thanks and rejoice to have so many music makers with us today. Thank you all. Helping us remember that God created us for joy and freedom. And when we miss the mark and fail to live as God created us to live in love and unity and peace, we may carry shame and guilt. And, and those things are not from God. They are a result of our living, but they are not God's will. So trusting in God's grace to forgive, let us honestly come before God and confess those wrongs that we need carry no longer. Let us pray. Holy One, maker of all, have mercy on us. Jesus Christ, servant of the poor, have mercy on us. Holy Spirit, breath of life, have mercy on us. Before God, with the people of God, we confess to our brokenness, to the ways we wound our lives, the lives of others, and the life of the world. God, forgive us by your grace. And hear now our silent confession. Friends, let us now hear the good news. With eternal mercy and unconditional love, God forgives us, Christ renews us, and the Spirit enables us to grow in love. Know that we are forgiven, and may we be at peace with thanksgiving to our Creator, Redeemer, and Sustainer. Amen. It is the very peace of Christ that we receive with God's forgiveness. And we invite you to safely share a sign of peace with one another, keeping safe distance. Off you may stay seated or stand up, however you wish. Let us share Christ's peace. The peace of Christ be with you.
This is now the time in our service for a blessing of children. And we take a moment to give thanks to God for children in our midst. And I will read the leader part, and you can read the response. And then afterwards, kids are invited to go out the back door with me out to the playground for kids Sunday school. And parents can pick them up out on the playground afterward, which is right out here. Jesus said, whoever welcomes a child in my name welcomes me. Children are welcome in this place. Jesus said, whoever becomes humble like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. May we learn from the children in our midst. May we nurture these children with love and prayer. Thank you, God, for children. Amen. Amen. Kids are invited to come with me to Sunday school. Have a wonderful time, kids. <laughs> Friends, the word of God is before us, and before Rex reads the word for us today, we're going to sing our prayer of illumination together. You can either sing or just take a moment of peace to welcome God's spirit into your heart so that we may hear what God has to say to us today. As we, as we prepare to hear God's word read and proclaimed, let us pray for illumination. Oh, all right, thank you. <laughs> I have my script. <laughs> Ready? God of wisdom, be in my listening. Speak to my soul's deep. Holy Spirit, help us set aside everything we think we know about you, your word, and our spiritual path for a new experience of all these things that we may see Christ more clearly, love Christ more dearly, and follow Christ more nearly. Amen. A reading from the Old Testament, Joshua, verse 9. Be strong. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. And now a reading from the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 1 through 10. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. So the woman hurried away from the tomb, afraid, yet filled with joy, and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him clasped his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. There they will see me. The word of God for us. Good morning, beloved. It is a joy to be here. I want to start with a story. This is a long story. It's a true story. Maybe some of you have heard it, so I'm going to ask a little bit of grace. Concerns a man by the name of Marcel Sternberger. Marcel was a noted portrait photographer who immigrated from Hungary to the United States in 1941, just ahead of World War II. He was known a little bit as a misanthrope, which is unusual for a portrait photographer. He really didn't like people all that much. He was technically perfect, very attached to his routine and ridiculously punctual. Because every morning, 
every single morning, he would take the 909 Long Island Railroad train from his home to Woodside where he would trade for a subway that took him into Manhattan. Every single morning. Until one cold January morning in 1948, where while he was on the 909, he realized that he had a friend who was in Brooklyn who was ill and uncharacteristically decided he should go visit his friend. So he got off at an unfamiliar subway station, took an unfamiliar subway into Brooklyn, and spent a very pleasant half morning with his friend. About noon, he decided he should go back into his studio in Manhattan. So he went back to that unfamiliar subway station to catch a subway train to get into Manhattan. Now, Marcel had been in New York long enough to know that a midday train from Brooklyn to Manhattan would likely be pretty crowded, and so there would be little chance of a seat. But just as he entered the subway car, an elderly man to his left jumped up and ran off the train. So Marcel took the seat. Now, Marcel had also been in New York long enough to know that unless you're me, you don't you generally strike up a conversation with a stranger. But he did have the habit of looking at people's faces as a portrait photographer. So he looked at the young man sitting to his left. And there he saw unbearable sorrow. He also saw that the young man was reading a newspaper that was printed in Hungarian. So uncharacteristically, Marcel said to the young man, I hope you don't mind if I glance at your paper. The young man looked up, startled to be addressed in his native language, but said, no, it's fine. You may look at it now. I'll have time later. So they started to talk. The young man's name was Bela Paskin. He came from a large town on the eastern edge of Hungary called Debrezhen. Marcel knew Debrezhen, so they chatted for a little while. And then Bella told him the rest of the story. Bella had been a law student before World War II. When the Germans overran Hungary, he was captured and taken to a camp in the Ukraine where he was put to work for the Germans. When the Russians took the camp back over, he was put to work burying the German war dead. When the war was over, he took to the road and crossed hundreds of miles to get back to Debrezhen. As soon as he got to the town, and this warms my heart as a mother, he went to the apartment where his father and mother and his brothers and sisters had lived to tell them he was okay. But when he got there, there were strangers living there, and they could tell him nothing about his family. So he raced up the stairs to the apartment that he'd shared with his wife, and the same story. There were strangers there, and they knew nothing about his family. Stunned, completely unsure as to where to go start to look, he went out and he sat on the stoop outside the apartment, his head in his hands, and suddenly heard Paskin Baski, which means Uncle Paskin. It was the son of some friends of his parents. The young man took Bella to his parents' house and there they told him the news. His entire family had been captured and taken to Auschwitz and there they had all been killed. There was no hope. Heartbroken completely unsure as of what to do next, Bella wandered the streets of Debrezhen for a few days and then, realizing there was nothing left for him there, took again to the road, crossing border after border after border, a thousand miles to Paris, where he was finally allowed to emigrate to the United States in October of 1947, just three months before he'd met Marcel. Now, the whole time he was telling this story, Marcel couldn't help but think this sounds really familiar. Just a few weeks before, at Christmas time, he'd been invited to a Christmas party of a very important client of his. The party was back in Manhattan in the evening. Marcel doesn't like parties, didn't want to get back on the Long Island Railroad train on a crisp December evening to go to a party, but he felt he had to. And there he met a young woman who worked for his client. Her name was Maria. She too was from Debrezhen. She too had been sent to Auschwitz. She'd been put to work in a German munitions factory, and while she was there, her entire family was killed. When the Americans took the camp over, she was on the first boat of displaced persons back to the United States. Fumbling in the side of his pocket for his address book, Marcel asked in what he'd hoped was a casual tone, by any chance was your wife's name Maria? Bella's eyes flew open, and all he could say was, how did you know? Well, the subway car was approaching a station, so Marcel took Bella by the elbow and said, let's get out here. Took him to a phone booth. Anybody remember phone booths? And dialed Maria's number. 
because he'd been so moved by her story that he felt he should take her contact information down at the party, thinking, at least I can do is bring her back home for a home-cooked meal when the weather is nicer. So he dialed Maria's number. Now, Maria lived in a boarding house, single room, with a common area outside. And the one telephone for the entire boarding house was right outside her door. But she had developed the habit of never answering it because it was never for her. She really didn't have any friends. But that day, there was no one else home. So the phone rang, and it rang, and it rang. And finally, Maria thought, I should take a message. So she answered. Marcel reminded her who he was and how they'd met, and then said, Maria, I'm going to ask you a very strange question. Can you describe your husband for me? Surprised, she did. And then he said, Maria, can you tell me the address of the apartment that you shared with your husband when you were in Debrecen? And she did. So Marcel covered the receiver. Remember having to cover the receiver? It doesn't work with cell phones. <laughs> and he turned to Bella and he said, when you lived in Debrecen with your wife, was this the address of your apartment? Bella's face turned white and he said, yes. So Marcel took the receiver and handed it to Bella and said, here, something miraculous is about to happen to you. Speak with your wife. Bella took the phone and listened for a minute and then broke into sobs. And all he could say was, it is Bella. It is Bella. Marcel realized that Bella was becoming incoherent, so he took the receiver back and listened for a minute, and realizing that Maria was equally hysterical on the other end, said, stay where you are. I'm going to bring your husband to you. We'll be there in a few minutes. So he hung up the phone and turned to Bella, and Bella was trembling, and all he could say was, I, I'm, I go see my wife. Well, Marcel realized this was a moment into which no stranger should intrude, and so he hailed a cab, and he put, Marce he put Bella in the back, and he handed the taxi driver the fare and the address, and he waved goodbye. Any skeptics in the room? Anybody sitting there going, no way. There's just too many coincidences. That can't be a true story. But was it? Was it chance that Marcel uncharacteristically went to a Christmas party that he normally wouldn't go to, only to meet a young woman whose story so moved him that he felt compelled to write down her contact information? Was it coincidence that uncharacteristically, on the train that was his usual routine, he decided to go to a different place to visit a friend? Was it chance that the elderly man jumped up and ran off the train just as Marcel entered? Was it coincidence that no one else was home? when Marcel called Maria? Was it chance? Or was God riding the Brooklyn subway that afternoon? You know, when you hear a story like that, something that is so touching, so compelling, so amazing, you sorta of have to share it. So why is it? Why is it we have trouble sharing the most compelling, the most amazing, the most soul-touching story of all? Why is it we have so much trouble sharing the gospel? Better prophets than I have said, not I, Lord, like Moses did. I am slow of tongue and I stutter. Or like Jonah who said, not me, Lord. You send me out there, they're going to make fun of me and I'm going to feel like a fool. We are hesitant. We're embarrassed. We don't think we can answer the tough questions and goodness knows there are enough of those. And so we just don't. Now, the verses in Matthew that Rex read are unusual verses for August 1st, I will admit. It's, of course, the final chapter in Matthew. It's the Easter chapter. And at the end of that chapter, Christ gives the Great Commission to his disciples. It is the last commandment he gives after three years of an earthly ministry. It's his greatest challenge to his disciples. This, disciple, this chapter of Matthew is a short chapter, it's only 20 verses. But three times in that chapter, we are told to go and tell. And when you're told the same thing three times in that short a period of scripture, that's a message we have to pay attention to. It's a roller coaster chapter. It starts out with the women going to the tomb, there to weep and pray and mourn for their dead Messiah. But what do they find? The stone is rolled away, the tomb is empty, and there sits an angelic being. Can you imagine how terrified they were? 
how confused they were. Because Christ had told his disciples and his followers over and over what would happen, but they never quite got it. In Matthew um, 28, verses 5 through 7, the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come, see the place where he lay. Go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead, and behold, he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him. Behold, I have told you. Do not be afraid. Go and tell. And I guess the angel was told to go and tell too, so there are probably four goes and tells in there. And immediately after that, in verse 8, and they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy and ran to report it to his disciples. And behold, Jesus himself came and met them and greeted them. And they came up and they took a hold of Jesus' feet and worship him. And then Jesus himself said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell the disciples, tell my brethren to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. Do not be afraid. Go and tell. A scant eight verses later, the disciples have made the 90-mile journey from Jerusalem to Galilee. And there they behold the risen Christ, who tells them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and teach tell the nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit telling them to observe all that i have commanded you do not be afraid for i have been given all authority go and tell and jesus authority didn't end there because of course he gave it to his disciples he sent out 11 and they changed the world because they had his power with them they were literally co-missioned to Jesus' mission on earth. As we are today, it continues to be our mission. Go, tell, grow the kingdom, make disciples. And of course, only disciples can make disciples. It's not easy at first. As Presbyterians, we have trouble with it. It's personal, we say. I don't want to offend anyone. Maybe they'll see it by the way I live my life. Well, personally, I don't know about you, but I hope nobody's looking too closely at my life. I have a friend who pastors a church that gives out several hundred meals a week in their parking lot. And one evening, he challenged the people who were handing out the meals to tell the people that were receiving the food why they were doing it. Yes, we want to feed you in two ways. I'm giving you this meal because I love Jesus, and I want you to know that Jesus loves you too. And the response the pastor got was, I don't think I can do that. I might offend someone. Really? So they decided to do it with stickies. They put stickies on the top of each meal to start that says, I'm doing this because Jesus loves me, and I want you to know that Jesus loves you too. And after about three or four months, that got a little awkward for the people who were handing out the meals. So they started to say it. And then they started to stay more. And then they started to quote scripture. They started conversations. They created relationships. They created some Bible studies. The people started going to church. Maybe not that church, but a church. Do not be afraid. Go and tell. It's hard to make disciples when you're uncomfortable talking about it. And what's worse, our secular society is largely hostile to a confession of Christian faith. But it is ultimately the identity that defines us most certainly defines us most eternally. So there are some things that you can do to take that first step. First, you've got to claim the power that Christ has given you. It is there for you now. You do not have to wait for it. You do not have to earn it. It is here in this room, in every one of us, right here, right now. And then you have to realize that all you have to do is open the door, plant the seed. You don't have to do the final work of conversion. That's the Holy Spirit. So knowing that, here's a few suggestions to get you started. Jenna told you I used to work for Procter & Gamble. I was there for 26 years. The last 10 years I was there, I very deliberately and prayerfully signed every single one of my emails, and goodness knows there were hundreds every day, internally and externally, not with kind regards or sincerely, but with blessings. One of the women who worked for me said, do you really want to do that? You could really get in trouble. But I did, and I never once got a pushback. 
I had people come and say, can I talk to you? Can we go in the huddle room? Bible studies sprang up. Prayer groups sprang up. One of my VPs said, you don't know how much that made me smile every time I saw it. For your personal emails, put your favorite Bible verse underneath it. Mine is Psalm 16, 8. I know the Lord is with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. There's a longer story as to why that's my verse. That's for another time. Hold the door open longer when you're going into a building. Compliment people. Smile at them. When you're in the line at the bank or the post office or the drive through at McDonald's, instead of saying, have a nice day, say, be blessed. You'll be shocked at how many people put their hands over their hearts and say, thank you. When someone asks you how you are, instead of saying fine, which means feelings internalized, not expressed, <laughs> say you're blessed. When the gossip streams start, use that as an opportunity to tell people how you've been taught to love people who you might not even like, maybe even people who don't like you. When the hard times come, and they will, use that as an opportunity to talk about the hope that you carry with you, that you've been given. And then, of course, there's the St. Francis of Assisi method, which is preach at all times and, when necessary, use words. I said that once in a confirmation class I was teaching, and this gorgeous young 13-year-old girl said, whoa, mind blown. <laughs> but it works. And I promise you, when you do it, you will be amazed at how it changes you. Because every act of blessing you offer is an act of praise and worship. And there's a promise in it for you, too. Because the very last piece of scripture in Matthew 28 is the promise that Jesus left with his disciples. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. You do not do this alone. Do not be afraid. Go and tell. It took a while for the disciples to make that 90-mile journey up to Galilee. It's about a five-day walk. It will take a while for the people you speak with, who watch you, to come to faith too, and that's okay. When the disciples got to the risen Christ, some believed and some doubted. Some of the people that you speak with too will doubt, and that's okay. The point is, you've planted the seed. So friends, do not be afraid. You've been given the power to share the hope that you carry. Go and tell. Now, you want to hear the end of the story I started with? Marcel got back in touch with Bella and Maria several months later, and they told him that their reunion was so emotionally charged and so poignant that neither one of them could really remember it afterwards. Maria said, all I remember is I went to the mirror to see if maybe my hair had turned white. And the next thing I know, there's a taxi outside, and it is my husband who is coming to me. And for the first time, after all that we had been through, we're happy, but I've never lost my capability to not be afraid that every time he walks out the door, I might not see him again. Bella, however, was very clear. God, he said, providence brought us back together. And so from that point forward, Bella became a pastor and opened up a church for Hungarian refugees on the Lower East Side. For the rest of his life, Bella was out on the streets, clothing the cold, feeding the poor, and going about the business of going and telling. He knew what commission Christ had given him. So my friends, my beloved, go. Do not be afraid. Christ is with you. Go and tell and be blessed. Amen. Amen and amen. Thank you. Friends, our God will meet us at the table today. As we have heard God's word proclaimed, we will gather with God and each other at the table. And as a reminder, it is a table of grace, a table that is for each and every one of us. And so we will sing to that now.
the good news you've been inviting no matter what others may say your darkest sins will be forgiven you will always have a place at the table of grace the cups never always full and it's never too late to come and be filled with love never ending you're always welcome at the table of grace so come you weak and heavy hearted don't try to hide your earthly start for in God's eyes we all are equal don't be afraid come as you are at the table of grace the cup's never empty the place always full and it's never too late to come and be Friends, this table of grace before us is just one example, a very primary example of the abundance of all the gifts God gives us to do our life with together. And out of gratitude for these gifts, and especially the Holy Spirit that empowers us to go and tell using all of our talents and our time and our treasure, we return to God a portion of all of those gifts in our Sunday morning offering. You are invited to give uh, tangibly today on the way out. There are offering plates you may give online um, as you feel led. Let us give thanks for the gifts of our lives and dedicate our offerings to God. Let us pray. God, we do thank you for all the gifts you give us, our time, our talents, our many treasures, our money, in all of its forms. Thank you for this opportunity to bring you joy by being generous and loving and serving with those gifts. Take them now, God, and use them to further your realm here on earth of your peace and love and restorative justice. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
we are welcomed to this table of God's grace. And a few words of instruction during this ongoing time of pandemic, we have communion kits, and if you did not receive one on your way in from an usher, just raise your hand, they will bring you an individual kit. And afterwards, uh, we invite you to take that uh, disposable kit and return it to a basket as you leave. There are baskets there for you. As we partake together, you're invited to briefly lower your mask and eat and drink and then replace your mask again. And also, uh, an announcement, given that we are in a new surge of the pandemic, um, we thank you for minding distancing and masking indoors and outdoors. We encourage you to continue your fellowship after worship as much as possible outside on this beautiful day. And if you're not with people in your own household and if you're close to them, uh, we encourage you to keep masked as well to do our part for the common good. Thank you. So this is the feast of our creator that Jesus instituted on the night before he died as a reminder that in life and in death we belong to God and we are never separated from God's love and grace. This is a table that is here to nourish us on our spiritual journey while we are yet here on earth together. Everyone is welcome here. This is God's table. It is Christ who invites us here. It is Christ who promises to meet us here. Let us give thanks as we pray. God, you are blessed. It is you who brought forth bread from the earth and created the fruit of the vine. In the beginning, you watered the earth that all creation might have food and drink. You gave to your servant Sarah bread to strengthen her family on their journey and wine to make them glad. You called Moses and Miriam and your people Israel out of bondage and refreshed them with food in the wilderness. You gave Mary and Jesus their daily bread to share. And when the time was right, you sent your son, your servant, our brother Jesus, into the world to love and serve as the bread of life for all creation. And here at your table, you offer this bread and this cup for our journey to nourish us as your children. So with gratitude in our hearts and on our lips, we join our voices with angels and all the saints who forever praise you. And we ask that you now send your spirit that by your power, this ordinary table will become a sacred banquet as we share it with one another and keep sharing it day by day. As we break bread and drink the cup together, unite us as your human family with gratitude. Friends, we now join in our other prayers, the prayers of the people. We remember the concerns on the Knox Weekly Prayer List. And also this morning, we remember the family of Ashley Dillian Mullen. Uh, there, she has a brother-in-law who is seriously ill and hospitalized. We remember his family. And we lift up Jessica Kersey and her spouse, TJ. First of all, in thanksgiving for their newborn daughter, Evie, who was born Monday. And also, we keep Jess and all of her family, including her parents, Pam and Jeff Kersey, in prayer. Jeff has, Jessica has been hospitalized this weekend. So we lift up them in prayer for Christ's peace and healing. Now let us go to God with all of our hearts and prayers. God, we give you thanks for all the joys in the world. In this time of Olympics, we thank you for the wonders of our bodies and our abilities and the joy of expressing them and the amazing feats that we can accomplish and goals that can be reached. May these Olympic Games serve to further unity and peace among nations of the world. And God, we remember and lift up all the hurting places in the world, those living in the midst of wildfires, both in our nation and around the world, and for other natural disasters that are affecting peoples and lands and creation. God, we pray for peace. We pray for healing and show us best how to love and serve those who are suffering. 
We lift up all who are affected by violence of any kind, through war, through leaders who are seeking their own will for their own fortune and gain rather than the good of the whole, for violence in our homes, in our schools, our workplaces. And especially today, we remember those victims of gun violence as we also give thanks for the amazing Stop the Violence event at Third Presbyterian Church yesterday and all the people who came out and were blessed through that experience to help spread your love by being people, voices, actors of peace. God, sustain us in those efforts and may we always join together to be the hands and feet and beating heart of Christ. We remember all who are sick today all who are fearful of health realities and potentialities. We lift up all caretakers. And especially during this surge of COVID, we remember all frontline workers and anyone who is suffering because of COVID in any way. We pray for ongoing research for vaccines, we lift up all who live in fear of economic insecurity. We pray for all who are hungry and homeless and cold and hopeless. For all those living in the grip of addiction. All who experience deep loneliness. And all who grieve this day, the deaths of loved ones, and losses of any kind. God, in this space, in this silence now, we lift to you our other prayers, knowing that you are listening better than we are speaking. We pray. Lord, hear us. In church, we now join together in the prayer that Jesus taught, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. For those of our friends who are worshiping virtually, uh, be sure that you too have your bread and your cup as we prepare to feast together. On the night of his arrest, Jesus was gathered with his closest friends, the disciples. And after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new relationship sealed in the pouring out of my blood, poured out for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this, do so in memory of me. And friends, whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of Christ until Christ comes again. And Christ comes again in every act of loving kindness we give and receive. These are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. And together we will keep the feast. Let us now take our bread. This is the bread of life broken for you. Let us eat together. And now let us take our cup 
this is the cup of salvation for you. Let us pray. In deep gratitude for this meal, this moment, these companions, we give ourselves to you, God. Take us out to live as changed people because we have shared your holy meal and we cannot remain the same. So ask much of us, expect much from us, enable much by us, and encourage many through us. May we live to your glory, O oh God. Amen. Sisters and brothers, inspired by the word of God today to go and tell, and by Lisa's proclamation of that message, we are going to sing a song to close our worship service called Go Out and Tell. So you're invited to stand or embody in spirit. Please sing with us. If you feel like moving, please move. If you feel like clapping, please clap, but please sing along.
Sisters, do not waste the waiting time. This is the time the Lord has given you to do as he has commissioned us. Do not be afraid. Go and tell. And now, may you go with the strength of the Father, the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit within you. Practice love without edges, forgiveness without borders, and justice without margins, for this is what the Lord requires of you. And now, may the God of time the Lord of our spirit, go with you from this moment forward and be with you in all of your moments, blessing you as you leave this place both now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>